Okay, so welcome everyone to this month's uh, Systems and at Play Meetup. So uh, let's talk a couple of things. Special welcome to new members. We kind of clocked more than 461 since we prepared this. I think we're close to 480 at the moment. So every meetup, I think we are uh, going up by about 15 uh, new members. So we are all six continents and still hunting someone in Antarctica who would like to either present or uh, be part of. 21 countries, 48 cities, quite impressive. We're all around the world. So first of all, um, why do we care about this meetup? So System at Play was basically born from two main inspirations to respond to current dominant uh, reductionist way of thinking and acting in the world and the difficulty to understand the deep and vast space of systems thinking and practical ways of applying it. So soon this turned into passion. And what is it now? Four years afterwards, we are still uh, running with it and there is much, much more interesting stuff to come. So it's really uh, uh, interesting how the whole thing is uh, developing. Uh, today we have Mark as guest. Uh, he's focused on organizational awareness and adaptiveness with Wordly Maps. He uses Wordly Maps, the next things, sorry, uh, the next big management innovation thing after Agile. And uh, he uses them to enable organization to quickly learn how to align people and tap into collective intelligence and start making strategic moves. Um, their rivals won't be able to uh, respond. So uh, quite an interesting talk. And uh, at the end, maybe we can revisit this, why he thinks this is the next big thing after Agile. By the way, uh, all our uh, meetups, because they're online, they're recorded. And you can find the recording at YouTube. Just search for Systems at Play. Um, so tonight meetup, first of all, note, we will be presenting uh, this as it goes straight away after the meetup. It'll go to uh, also be uh, put on uh, YouTube. Um, Marcus would like guys to for you to stay muted during the presentation. So double check that you're muted and ask any questions in the chat and we'll address them afterwards. We probably will have uh, enough time. If required, of course, we can extend uh, a bit. So before we begin, any questions from anyone? No question, but uh, not from me unless there's someone else asking question. Hi everyone, good evening, apologies for being late. I just wanted to add this, um, from this year, we kind of changed our approach a little bit and decided to focus a bit more on the practitioners. So in the last few <clears throat> sessions, we focused a lot on folks who are uh, more practitioners applying system thinking, complexity thinking, or anything around that, those ideas into the day-to-day -day work. So first few years, it was more around understanding the concepts of this, this year, particularly have been mostly around practitioners. So, and uh, I think we've got a, so far, we've got some really, really good practitioners sharing their insight in system thinking. So just wanted to add that. So there was a slight shift um, <clears throat> into our approach this year. Thanks, that. Any other notes, guys? Any other questions? If not, Marcus, all yours. Okay, thank you. You can see my screen, okay? Perfect. Okay, just let me just minimize the window. Okay. okay. Um, so nine ways to stop your organization shooting itself in the foot. So this presentation is based on Wardley mapping. So that's Simon Wardley for those of you who uh, are not familiar with him. And he based his Wardley mapping method on the five factors from the art of war, where Sun Tzu wrote that all leaders are familiar with these five factors, yet it's he who masters them who takes the victory. 
So if you are in a competitive battle with others, then victory will go to the side that has the more compelling mission. So this was Wardley's mission, to free organizations from the clutches of management consultants, which I found particularly appealing as an ex-management consultant myself. Um, the second factor is to understand your landscape. And the best tool for understanding a landscape is a map. And that's probably, if you've heard of Wardley mapping, what you may be most familiar with, what a friend of mine once called the, the dots and squiggles. But Wardley mapping is far more than just the maps, because there are also 30 economic models that Wardley calls the rules of the game that you can apply to your maps to help you anticipate how the future is, is evolving. And that reveals where there are opportunities and threats. Um, and that's where you can then start to make your moves. Um, there's a playbook of 60 plus moves that you can combine in unique ways to create uh, strategic responses that your rivals will struggle to respond to. But for the purposes of this presentation today, I wanted to focus on the principles, what Wardy calls his doctrine, but essentially it's a series of principles, which I feel are extremely valuable and a really good insight into Wardy mapping for those who are new to it. So these principles are, uh, universally useful, and they are the basis of the Wardy mapping method. So when I was doing, when, when Michal invited me to come on to this presentation, I got in touch with Simon and said, you know, can you just summarize for us just to make sure we're on the same page where these principles come from? So this is from Simon himself, who, who turned around and said that when he was starting to firstly use his own version of maps in 2005 for pre-mortem challenge and post-mortem learning, he started to notice some patterns occurring. And some of these patterns occurred irrespective of what we did. These are the economic rules of the game. Some of those patterns were context specific. You can make a certain move in one industry that you can't make in another. So that's the gameplay. But there seemed to be other patterns that were universal, but we had a choice about whether to use them or not. And those are the principles. So we ran a series of large scale population studies to try to identify whether these principles actually existed in the wild. And he found that they did. And when he did research comparing US and Chinese companies, he, started, he found that the Chinese companies were using these principles even more widely than the US companies did. And that perhaps suggests that there is a universal element to them, irrespective of your industry, your culture, or other factors. So these principles are, are grouped into six categories, how we communicate, how we develop, how we operate, learn, lead, and how we're structured. But they also come in four phases. So you need to do phase one as a foundation to build phase two. And phase two you need before you, you, you focus on phase three and so on. So what I wanna focus on in this presentation is just the first nine principles, which is about stopping your organization harm in itself. There's nothing particularly dramatic or groundbreaking in this. These are some basic principles. The surprising thing is how few organizations actually use them and how many organizations actually fall down on them. So I was gonna go through these principles and then we can take questions at the end because I've got a lot of slides to get through. So I'll try to go through them at a good pace. So the first principle is basically to focus on your user, user's needs rather than your own. And I've found that the biggest mistake organizations make is focusing on their own needs. And what looks fantastic to, from our perspective can actually look terrible from the perspective of a user. So whenever I bring this up, you normally get what I call the Ford objection. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they'd have said faster horses, but there's no evidence that Henry Ford ever said this. So I think we can dismiss it. Then we get the, the Steve Jobs objection where we just need to make insanely great products. But if we take what Jobs actually said, and I realize he said a lot of things, so I'm cherry picking here, but he said that people don't wanna know about computers. They want to know how computers will help them live better. So again, you've got to start with the customer needs and work back towards the technology, not the other way around. Um, and what successful organizations do is, this is from Adrian Cockcroft, uh, former VP at Amazon Web Services when he was speaking at MapCamp in London in 2019, quite simply said, if you want to know why Amazon did something, it's because we saw an unmet customer need, an underserved market. Um, so we help organizations, this is a, 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 a an, an approach used by a colleague of mine from the riotpoint.com um, who called it the customer revolution. You quite simply to see the world through the eyes of your customers, just find a dozen or so users who are willing to be recorded in an interview. Uh, ask them just one question. Don't interrogate them. Ask them one question, such as you know, think of an interaction you've had in the last 12 months connected to whatever your product or service is meant to do that either delighted or disappointed you. And then ask them to describe what happened in their own words stitch those recordings together into one video 
and then play it back to your teams. So your teams can then immerse themselves by watching the video into the world of their users, seeing the world through their eyes. So they can start to imagine what users feel when they're interacting with your products and services. And that helps you uncover the pain points you should be focusing on and also identify what needs your products and services should be helping them to achieve. And this is, of course, the Stanislavski method, which actors use to get into the minds and into the worlds of their characters. But it can also be used quickly and simply for organizations to start seeing the world through their users uh, through their users' eyes. So Michal, as I said, asked me to, to try to um, put some practical applications to some of these principles from my own experiences. So this is one that we had actually this summer. It's a client that we're still working with at the moment. So medium-sized payment solutions company, they're very innovative, but they've kind of hit a wall in terms of growing further. So we mapped things out over the summer and then they understood, a, for them, a big revelation. They understood their partners, the banks, intimately they really didn't understand their users at all. And that's where they're struggling to identify what they need and what they should be developing. So they're now running through the customer's revolution um, to try to identify unmet needs as a guide for next steps to use that as their North Star. So before you focus on user needs, of course, you need to know who your users are. And you'd really be surprised, I think, at how many organizations simply don't know who their users are. If you're in the B2C world, then you know who your customers are. They're the people who buy things in your shops. And if you're in the business B2B world, then you know who your customers are. They're the procurement department buying things from you. But these people are buying things for other users, for their family or their friends or their employees or even their own clients. And if you're, don't, if you're not aware of what users actually need, there's a big chance that the users, if they don't like what you're doing, they're going to put pressure on your customers not to buy from you. So you do need to understand what your users are looking for as well, not just what your customers are looking for. So again, we have a very simple, um, a very simple exercise that we run with, with our clients to try to get them to think as their customers do, uh, see the world through their eyes and say, well, if you're the customer, who are your users? Who are you buying these things for? And what do those users actually need? By knowing this, you get a much better understanding of what's in your landscape and what you should be focusing on. So again, an example um, is not to try and go too far ahead with this because some organizations confuse customers and users. This is uh, an example from a few years ago, actually before COVID, where I was mapping for a multi-billion euro product distributor. New CEO had come in from outside of the industry. He gathered his, his executive team together, essentially to drive through his new strategy. He had a 70 slide PowerPoint deck with 95% done. So he had like that 5% that he was looking for people to say, well, I'm looking for your contribution. So he gets buy-in, but essentially he's just driving his own strategy. And when we mapped it out, it took us about an hour, hour and a half to realize these are not the customers. His entire strategy is not focused on their customers. And so when we realized this, we asked the executive team, well, what do your customers really need? And they don't know because they've spent years focusing on their own needs. So we had to very quickly, it's, it's a remedial exercise. We had to very quickly identify what we thought the real customers were, what they needed and map out how the distributor could start satisfying those. So yes, you need to know your users and customers, but don't you know, ignore the fact that you need to know who your customers are. And this at the time surprised me, but I've since realized this is a very, very common problem, not to know who your, your users are and sometimes even who your customers are. Um, the third principle is to use a common language. This is really about trying to overcome the Microsoftization in, in, in organizations that creates communication barriers. Everybody's using their own version of Microsoft, that particular tool that they prefer. So the baseline is kind of Excel, because that's what finance use. And that's why we all have to kind of do budgets once a year. Other people love PowerPoint, others love uh, Microsoft Word, and it creates confusion because people who, not everybody's familiar with Excel and forcing everybody to use Excel is, I mean, how do you use Excel for HR, for example? You can't measure performance in the same way. So what have we been using maps for? We've been using them for millennia to help us understand where we are and where our options for action are. We can use them for navigation, we can use them for in battles, and we just may use them today for getting around town. It took me a while to find one with Sydney on there, but I eventually found one. So we use maps because they're great for aiding communication and creating alignment. So that's where we use Wardy Maps. So I'm going to assume a basic understanding of Wardy Maps, but I'll just quickly run through it. So within a Wardy Map, the only access that really matters is the evolution access across the bottom. And that's telling us that everything we do and how we do it is evolving. 
evolves from the left of the map and moves to the right. So when something is new, it's the genesis of an activity or it's a novel practice or a new concept, it's uncharted, it's different. It's potentially a source of competitive advantage, but that's gonna be in the future. And at the moment it's risky because there's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability about it. And it's gonna change a lot. However, if whatever we do finds a demand, it will evolve and it will evolve into the second stage where it's gonna be custom built by a few different providers. Now it becomes potentially an emerging practice or a new hypothesis. And if it continues to get demand, it's gonna keep evolving through the product stage where it's a new product, a more mainstream product, and then a mature one. And eventually it becomes a commodity, an industrialized component that's low margin, it's stable, it's standardized, but potentially because it's a cost of doing business, you can have massive volume operations. So everything we do is in one of these four stages. So once we have that map, we can then start to do things like, well, before I go into that, I mentioned earlier that I, there's a variation that I have on Wardley mapping. I found that reducing Wardley's four stages of evolution to three stages makes the process of mapping much easier. So I've combined the first two into the what I now call the uncharted space. This is the genesis and custom built stage or the novel or emerging practice. The second stage is the transitional, so products and rental, good practice and theory. And the third stage remains the same, the commodity or utility or best practice space. So very much the same, but just we're reducing that cognitive overload a little bit by reducing four down to three. But it's the same map. And with that map, then we can start to do things uh, like understanding what each other are talking about. This is my favorite example of Ward is. And I think it's what really turned me on to the idea of mapping in the first place. So what is a world perception server? And the answer is you probably don't know because Wardley made that up. But that means we're now like the typical executive who has no idea what their IT department is talking about when they start talking technology. And when they start showing their own Microsoft tool, showing the system architecture, it can sound to us like they're talking Elvish. We have no idea what they're talking about. But because we have the Excel spreadsheets ourselves, because we're running the finances, then we have to be asked about whether we should be doing things like outsourcing certain things or building certain things. And the answer is, we have no idea. Everything's in Elvish. We have no idea what you're talking about. So we can't make these decisions. But if we then take this same information and put it into a map, and then we ask that question, should we outsource or build A? Well, now we can see this is in the uncharted space. This means that no one's actually done this before. There's a lot of uncertainty about this. So therefore, clearly, we're going to build that ourselves because there's nobody we can buy it from. Equally, when we look at B, we can see that it's in the industrialized space, which means it's either a commodity or it's being provided as a utility service. So that's probably something that we can find on the market quite easily. So we should be outsourcing that to others. So when we put this into English, we can turn around and find, and we can see that you know, outsourcing GPS was a far smarter move than trying to build it ourselves. But then when we look at the World Perception Server, well, we still don't know what it is, but we've got some level of comfort that we think that nobody else knows what it is because it's uncharted. And therefore, we can probably experiment with that ourselves. So this is why we use maps as a common language, because it aids communication and alignment. We don't have to know all the details. We just have to understand the context and we can start to make better decisions. So an example of that from real life, uh, I was working with a company that was very frustrated that they had an entrepreneurial owner that kept taking up, whose ideas kept taking up significant management time. And they had one particular idea that had been going around in endless meetings for six months. So we literally mapped it out in 45 minutes, it took us 15, 20 minutes to go uh, through this with the owner, looking at the capabilities needed to deliver it. And then within that hour, the, the owner, in my view, quite wisely, decided to drop the idea. So I can see now that it's, we can't do this. So he was able to go on to the next idea, but also free up his management team from having to go through that same idea for the next six months. So six months of meetings versus 45 minutes of mapping, you can start to see the advantages already straight away. Um, when we got maps, we can start to challenge assumptions. Uh, so why does challenging assumptions matter? Well, uh, the story, I don't know how true it is, but I like the story that Churchill was um, visiting the Royal Artillery Unit during World War II, where he saw a, a, a four-man team loading, aiming, firing, and then reloading a gun. Uh, but Churchill noticed a man standing off to the side and said, well, what's his role? He doesn't seem to be doing anything. And so the artillery officer turned around and said, well, that's fifth man. Uh, fifth man has just always been there, but he had no idea what fifth man was actually meant to be doing. 
So Churchill, being a curious individual in more ways than one, uh, started to research the artillery unit, found that it was first deployed in the Crimean War in the mid 1850s. And there he found a picture of the same artillery unit, older gun, different uniforms, but same four-man team, loading, aiming, firing, and reloading the gun. And off to the side was the fifth man who was holding the horses that they used to pull the guns around uh, 90 years uh, previously. Um, and that just gives you an idea that within organizations, you have a lot of fifth men, people who are doing things because they've always done them and no one's ever challenged why you're doing these things. Because if you start to challenge people and say why you're doing it, people tend to get defensive. Once you have a map though, you can start to look at the map and say, well, why are we doing that thing? And therefore you're starting to depersonalize challenge. You're making challenge about how you're creating value for a user rather than challenging people about why are you doing that in your job? So he puts people on the same page addressing the problem rather than having people challenging each other about what they're actually doing. So maps are a really good way to challenge assumptions and challenging assumptions is really important because there's a lot of fifth men hanging around most organizations. Um, so I had an, uh, another example of a company that was a senior team. They were discussing a challenge they had with a major client of theirs, a, Fort a Fortune 500 company, and we were using a map. And during that discussion, somebody questioned why a certain component was being provided the way that it was. Nobody knew, but everybody kind of instantly saw the potential if we provided that component in a slightly different way, which is what they did. Uh, that new service was rolled out to their client. That led to them winning a major international contract. And when the CEO spoke to the team afterwards and said, well, whose idea it was, everybody kind of looked at each other and went, we don't know. I mean, I was sitting in that meeting I don't know who it came from, but it came from the conversations we had where we were challenging the way that we were doing things. So this is the idea about challenging assumptions. It leads, it, it, it taps into collective intelligence and it can kind of lead to better solutions and better action. So all this is about leading up to situational awareness, about understanding what's going on around you. Because if you're in a competitive situation where people have the same technologies and the people are quite evenly matched, well, how do you gain a competitive advantage? Now, situational awareness from my own research seems to be, uh, as a concept, really seems to come from the Korean War, where the US Air Force was shooting down their Chinese and Korean counterparts at a ratio of about 10 to one, even though they both had elite pilots. And actually the MiG jets that the, the Soviet made MiG jets that the Chinese and Koreans were using were in some ways technically superior to the US jets. And what they eventually put this down to was that there was a bubble canopy over the, the US jets. And that allowed the pilot to have a 360 degree view of the landscape that they're operating in. So they can see things a split second earlier. But in an environment that's changing rapidly, being able to see things a split second earlier and put that into action can start to create a, a significant competitive advantage. And that's what Colonel John Boyd uh, codified with his OODA loops model, that effective action flows directly from orientation or how we make sense of the situation. But that can be amplified by being able to observe things a little bit uh, earlier. And that's why I use maps with organizations and try to explain that this is just a way that we can see things and we can challenge things and put things into action quicker. And then by using pre-mortem challenge and post-mortem learning, we can start to learn quicker than our rivals. So situational awareness then becomes a key skill in a landscape that's changing rapidly. Um, another example, I was working with a well-funded small tech company. They're quite rare, but they wanted to enter a growing market segment. They went out and commissioned market research, and that market research was essentially boiling the ocean. It was telling them a lot of things, uh, a, very a very little, very shallow information about a lot of different things. So we took, this was literally an hour just to map things out. Then they understood what they knew, what they didn't know, what questions they needed to get answers for, and then they commissioned new market research. The information was much better, enabled them to move into action, and also 10 times cheaper because now they were asking specific questions. So understanding, tapping into your collective intelligence first is a really good way of finding what you do know and what you don't know, and then you can start to outsource that information. This might be a bit controversial depending on, on certain audiences, uh, but principle number six is using appropriate methods. Um, tribes have got a tribe, but there really is no one right method that fits all situations. So whenever you get a map, 
you can put this chart on top of it. It tells you that anything in the uncharted space on the left-hand side, the Genesis or custom built stage, these things you're experimenting. Therefore, you can't buy it from the market because it doesn't exist and you can't outsource it. That's why you're going to do things in-house. Agile is a, agile methods are really powerful in this space because what you're trying to do is reduce the cost of change. You want to experiment widely so you can figure out the right things to do or the better things to do. And Agile is great at that. The problem is when you start to then try to impose Agile on everything else inside the organization, because things in the middle of the map, you're not here focusing on change. Here, this is an established product. So if you're using it, you would buy it off the shelf from commercial providers. If it's something you're providing to others, you may use other methods like lean, because that's much better at focusing on learning and reducing waste. The, the cost of change is not so important because it's not changing as much. These are incremental improvements rather than radical improvements. But again, if you start to try and say, well, lean worked in one place, therefore it works in every place, it's not because the components on the right hand side of the map these are things that you're going to outsource. You need electricity to run your offices, but you're not going to build your own power stations to run that. You're going to outsource it. Um, but if you're the person who's actually providing these components, which others are using in their value chains, then you're going to use some things like Six Sigma, because here you're focusing on reducing deviation. People are not going to use your platform if it's going out every few weeks. So you, different methods are valuable at different, in different parts of the map. So understand your map first, understand the context, and then say, yeah, these are the right methods to use. So the right methods here on the right-hand side will be outsourcing or Six Sigma. Those things in the middle, like the vision systems, autonomous vehicle manager, we're going to buy those off the shelf or using Lean. The world perception server, well, yeah, we're going to build that in within in-house with agile methods. You can also then understand what kind of people that you need. You may have engineers, but you have different types of engineers. You have some who love building and scaling things up, and those are the people who will be working on your platforms. You'll have certain people on the left-hand side who are your innovators, love dealing with things that are uncertain. But then you have the people in the middle who are your more commercially minded people. You're going to need different people to work on different types of, of, uh, of projects. Um, it also tells you what kind of investments that you're looking for. If you're using GPS, well, you're going to use utility-based pricing. You're going to pay for what you use. You're not going to invest up front in this. Uh, the things in the middle, these are going to be your commercial off the shelf, fixed price. You're going to just go and buy your vehicle state server. And the things on the left, if you're an autonomous vehicle, maybe you're looking for this to be outcome-based. You're going to pay based on what the outcomes are. And the World Perception Server, maybe you're doing the same, or maybe it's more venture capital funding. You're going to do time and materials and see whether it gives you some value. So there's not one right method for, for doing things, and there's not one right way to invest in things either. Um, an example of this, I was working with a consultancy who successfully outsourced their accounting practices, and therefore the, the senior partner wanted to outsource all back office functions. So if you're familiar with consultancies, you'll know that that will meet with significant resistance from non-client facing partners. Um, and so they called me in to go map things out. We took two days to identify everything that they could and should, and should sorry, and should not be outsourcing. And the result of that was that we out, they decide to outsource 50% of the things. They found that they could buy uh, 30, approximately 30% of these things cheaper as by commercial off the shelf services. But they were also able to identify 20% of the things that they're doing that they could develop themselves and not only use them themselves, but have them as new client services that they could make money from. So not one right method. You don't wanna outsource everything. You wanna outsource different things, build different things and buy depending on the context. So number seven, um, removing bias and duplication. Bias is a huge source of waste in an organization. Let's go back to the, 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 uh, the IT architecture. What normally happens is that people will look at it and say, what do I want to build myself? Not what should be built or should be or, or bought or outsourced. What do I want to build? And that's where you end up people building things they really should be buying or outsourcing. But you also have duplication as well. And duplication is far, far more common than you think it is. I was very skeptical of, of, of this chart when I first saw it many years ago, uh, where Wardy said that in any an organization of any reasonable size, for any technology, there's going to be six instances of duplication in an organization. And that was until I worked in that same consultancy I was talking about. And we looked at one part of the organization, just a, probably a a third of the organization, and we found 11 tracking systems doing the same thing. That's 11 teams with 11 different technologies all trying to do the same thing. 
So extrapolate across the entire organization, that would have been 30 instances of the same technology. And that's what made me realize that these numbers are not that surprising. 14 CRM systems in a national bank have been found, over 100 workflow systems in a government, over 170 cloud projects in a global technology firm, but the winner by far was over 1,000 estimated risk management systems in a global financial organization. People don't know what depart other departments are doing, especially if you're in a large organization, so people are starting to reinvent the wheel constantly, and that's a huge source of waste in an organization. Um, an example from my own of this, uh, we, as part of an efficiency drive, we mapped out an IT department's projects and processes that was driven by the CFO. We were sure that the, the IT department was very, very wasteful. And what we found was that they were custom building a subcomponent rather than using a Microsoft alternative. And when we asked them, we said, well, why are you doing that? They said, well, we don't like the Microsoft version. Okay, but as I explained to them, if you, even if you're successful in this, no one's gonna buy it, are they? Because you can't compete against Microsoft. So we understood that. And their second answer was like, well, we've only got one person working on it. So it's not really a problem. So what you're telling me is this one person, what if this one person leaves? You're not gonna be able to find talent who's gonna come in and work on a component that's a competitor of Microsoft because that's, that's, that's going nowhere. And finally, if you've got a guy in your organization you think is good enough to, have, to build something that's a competitive, uh, competitive to Microsoft, you really should be putting that person on a project that has value, that use, something that users really care about. And to be fair to them, it took them five minutes to kind of understand that this was not the right thing to do. So they bought the Microsoft product, redirected the person, start building things that the user care about. It's, it's a very straightforward and simple approach. Um, principle number eight is thinking small, as in knowing those details. In other words, stop outsourcing your thinking to others. Use maps to figure out the details yourself. And this is an example from the Food Standards Agency. I spoke to Julia Pierce, the director of FSA, a few years ago about this. And she explained, government department, 1,000 plus people, they were told to cut costs by 20%. I think that was part of Brexit. But they were also told at the same time, do not renew an outsource contract. You're going to have to do these things yourself. So, Julia said that they decided to, to map out their current landscape. They had a small team. They took a few weeks, and this was their map. So Julia turned around and said that it was a shock when they saw this, but it wasn't a surprise. They knew they'd been struggling for a long time. So what do you do with something this messy? Well, that's a representation of your organization. So it's not the map that's the problem, it's the organization. So Julia said that they, they, they started to adopt the principles what we've been going through here. The first one, focus on user needs. Their users had a need for better communication. So they mapped that out and then they started to say, well, all these things on the bottom left-hand side, why are we custom building things that users really don't care about? The value chain, things higher up the value chain means they're more visible to users and the things that users care about. So they decided, oops, so they decided that what they would do would be to stop custom building these things that users don't care about, just build the things on the left-hand side that they do care about, buy the components in the middle off the shelf, and then outsource the other things on the right-hand side to mobile providers and the internet. They don't need to build these things themselves. So within a short, within a couple of months, this is the map for that particular uh, part of the business and so they did the thing the same approach across the rest of the organization and i think she said it took about they took them about 11 months but this is what the organization looked like within 12 months now this map doesn't look particularly interesting or insightful to us because we don't know this context but if you're from the fsa this means a lot to you because you understand where it actually came from plus this is far easier to work with than that and that meant they could start to then make strategic moves, like they were going to launch a campaign to reduce waste. That's how they were appealing to what their shareholders wanted. And that was about naming, shaming people who were wasting things who were wasting things. They could also do things like open up the data about business practices around food standards and establish data standards to enable sharing of good and poor performance, contributing to global standards, but also learning from global standards as well. And they not only reduce their cost by 20%, they reduce them by 40% because now they understand the details and they can understand what they need to be doing and what creates value and what doesn't. So the final principle, and this is, uh, I realize I'm running out of time, but this is just one slide. Um, the final principle is, is about having a bias for data because in a changing world, you're either going to become a learning organization or you're going to be out competed by one that is. Great 
quote. I, I forgot where I picked this up from. So if anybody knows, do let me know where that's from. But this goes back to where Simon Wardy was originally starting to use his maps. He was using them for pre-mortem challenge. He was mapping out ideas for projects and plans and then making sure you're challenging by saying, well, who are your users for this? If you don't know your users, then you're probably doing the wrong, wrong thing. What do they need? Are you focused on their needs or your own needs? How will you satisfy those needs? And once you have that map, you can share it with others and say, what's not clear? What do you think we got wrong? What do you think we're missing? And you build up that understanding before you start spending money on implementing that project. But the same way, once you've run a project, you can then after it's finished, you can then look back at your original map and say, okay, let's learn what we got right and what we got wrong. Why did we get that right and wrong? What were our, what were our assumptions that we were building this on? And if there's anything that we've learned, what can we use to improve other projects that we're now running? And then you can start to have this feedback loop where you have a constant bias for data because you're learning what's working, what's not working and why. So um, final slide, adopting the first nine universally useful principles is really a fantastic way to stop shooting yourself in the foot. Because these are very basic things, but it's surprisingly common for people to be organizations to not be uh, using these principles or following these principles, some or all of them. So if this is at all interesting, I have my site, uh, powermaps.net, that goes into this in a little bit more detail. There's also um, a quick survey you can take about your team or your organization that helps you understand whether your organization is highly adaptive. That's based on these nine principles, whether you're actually falling down on these or not. And if you if you submit it, I'll send you a brief report on that for your team or your organization. We also have an adaptive leadership program where we take people through not just the first nine principles, but all 40 principles, that's a 12 month program. So if anybody's interested uh, for the people on this call, you know, if you drop me an email and, and we'll have a little chat, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the first workbook for free, which is about focusing on user needs and identifying your users. So for me, that's the golden principle. If you're focused on user needs, you're ahead of 90% of the market. Um, and then the final one is on Medium. I, as, as it was mentioned at the start of the call, I am writing a book on all of this. Uh, it's a very long process. I'm about halfway through. Um, but I, that book's called Outthink and Outmove, and that's being published on Medium at the moment. So I think the third part of that, uh, which is the climate patterns, I'll start publishing that towards the end of this month. So that's it from me. So hopefully that was interesting. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them if I can. Brilliant. Thanks, Max. So probably I can just go through the uh, through the chat. Alidad, you first had a comment there about on Chinese companies and Hair is in fact talking about users. Can you expand on that? Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, Hire actually have this kind of open ecosystem model where instead of even focusing on the customer as a transaction with the customer, they say how users are using our product. As an example, you have a washing machine. They don't just use look at features of the washing machine. They look at a user have to buy the dress and then they put it and they have to buy a certain type of um, washing powder and then they have to hang it somewhere. So through that, they've identified just for a washing machine, 2000 user scenarios. And through that, they actually, not, not only they've changed the design of their washing machine, they have added some IoT features that it connect to other devices. They also partner with other companies, even um, cabinet makers for certain type of dress, like if you very expensive dresses or things like that. They bring all of that into their ecosystem. So um, what Marcus said is uh, that for some reason, Chinese companies are using these approaches way more than the, the rest of the um, kind of Western world or the rest of the world in general. Um, it's very interesting, Marcus. I kind of haven't connected the dot before, but as you mentioned that, it just remind me of for a single washing machine, just one Chinese company have identified 2000 user scenarios. And that's uh, yeah, a different a, way. Yeah. yeah. Hire is a fascinating company. I wrote a blog on this recently because I think Hire is not one organization. It's a series of micro organizations that come together. Uh, the best example when I first came across what they were doing, I mean, Hire is a, is a mainstay of business school case studies and it has been going back decades, but they keep evolving. But there's an example from COVID where um, 
there were four junior employees who identified that their local hospital didn't have enough PPE equipment. So they created a, a database of suppliers and hospitals within their city. And I think it was within a few weeks that became the regional database. And within a, a month or two, it became the national database. This was four junior employees who'd launched this and they did not need to have it signed off by any single manager. And it became the national database. We're in so much trouble compared to Chinese organizations. It's not every Chinese organization. I have people who have friends who work in that part of the world and sometimes it can be very opaque and very slow. But some of these organizations are genuinely coming to eat our lunch um, in, in, in quite a dramatic way. Where I'm based, it's organization, Chinese organizations are really uh, dominating the market through things like the way that they're, they're, they're focusing. And, Hire's um, approach is uh, Rendon High, which is zero difference to customers. Everybody's an entrepreneur. But everybody, every employee needs to be connected to the users and identifying what the users need. So you going back to, it's basically the golden principle, focus on user needs. Everything else is secondary and the entire organization there. I think they also, during COVID, they said they went from, it's an organization of about 100,000 people. I think they said they went from around 2,000 people in HR down to 20 um because everything was put on platforms and everything is client facing hr needs to be mm. client facing as well hire is a fascinating organization i agree yeah we actually some of us you know myself and dave we partner with hire and starting a research center regional research center in australia uh, a lot of those uh, case studies are coming through and it's just so different but you're absolutely right it's very basic start with customers need you know people don't believe it right they think there's yeah. some fancy magic, but it's just, but I think just to achieve that single one, you do need to have some sort of a non-hierarchical kind of more flat type organization because the identifying the need is one, but quickly and in a responsive way, coming up with solution and putting that into, back into the market require a very responsive, non-hierarchical type organization as well. Decision-making is quite important there. Yeah, I, I, I find my, in my own work, it's much easier for me to work with medium-sized organizations rather than large organizations because large organizations are focused on their own needs. And there's an awful lot of non-value adding activities that need to be perpetuated to keep people in jobs. But once the competitive threat from China comes in and it starts to eat people's uh, organization's lunch, then people are going to have to adapt or they die. So I think that's that's one of the waves that are coming. But yeah, hire is, is I wrote a blog on that where where I use the concept of Portuguese man of war. This is not one thing. It's different organis organisms coming together to compete. And um, I was basing that on a number of articles and books that I've read that kind of summarize into, into like a thousand words. So maybe, maybe I can share that with you afterwards because it's for anybody interested, it's probably a nice little intro. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. If I can jump down the list, I was connected to the customer versus a user. Eris, you had the question in regards to that. So just to continue on that theme. Eris? No, it was a question for the presenter. Thank you. Yeah, you want to expand about this? What do you mean by how do you recognize them? Oh, it was in one of the slides earlier where he said, you know, begin with don't confuse the customer with the client. So uh, how how would the gentleman uh, approaches that talking to a client and how do you distinguish between them? Seems that uh, there's not there's there's a blur between the two. Frankly, this is a, a very good point. And I was the question is how does he go about distinguishing it to the client at the beginning? Of, I'm guessing it's the earlier days of that uh, engagement. So when I um, work with clients and we're mapping. So I have a, a, another service called Strategy in a Day, which it's the start of understanding where you can play. So that example that I gave you on, on here of, of that multi, uh, multi billion euro uh, product distributor, I didn't do this and I started to do this afterwards. I didn't identify who the users were before we went in. And they struggled to understand who their customers were, who their users were, and that's where it was became a very difficult session. Since then, I've always taken um, a, a meeting beforehand and it's just five or six questions that I ask the client. Who are you? What do you do? Why do you do this? That gives us their vision. What problem are we trying to solve? So what's the purpose for this engagement? 
who are your users and what do they want? And so that users, that's often a really, um, it's a simple question, but it has some complex uh, connotations. I like to focus on an internal user and an external user. If you focus on an internal user, like shareholders or owners, when you map that out from their perspective, you get what the organization looks like. But then I turn around and say, we want an external user. So what's an external user? It's a customer. It's somebody who buys what you do. And that's easy, should be easy to figure out because you have your list of, of your invoices and who those invoices come from, normally in some kind of database. So we start basically by saying, well, who's your biggest customer? Of course, that customer has other users, but we start where we, we have to find somewhere to start where we're mapping. So we start with who are you interacting with, who are buying your goods today? So that's your customer. Then we get into looking at other needs and because what I show people on this strategy in the day is how to map. So once they say, well, that's our customer, but we actually we know that our customer is buying for their customers. So they say, well, is it useful for us to kind of map out those users, their customers? So yeah, they're not your customers, but they are your users. And knowing what they need and what they want is going to influence your customers' buying decisions. So yeah, generally you will be mapping everybody in your landscape, but you can't start in by going to an organization saying, let's make 500 maps just because people are not going to do it. So you start somewhere. So for me, I'm start, I say users rather than customers because your users will be the shareholder or the owner as an internal customer, as an sorry, internal user. And the external user will be the customer is who's buying your goods today. And then from there, we can get a little bit more sophisticated and get a little bit more granular. So generally who's giving you money? And then once you start to understand what their needs are, then you can start to turn around with that exercise that I showed you, the octopus I call it, is that you can start to say, well, why are they doing that? Who else are they trying to satisfy? So it's, just, it's a little bit of a step-by-step -step process. But generally, who, who do you need to impress? Who do you need to please most? You need to please the boss, and you need to please the people giving you money. So that's where I start mapping from. Hopefully that answers your question, Ernest. Um, it, it does. So just a quick follow-up question on that one so would you approach it saying that um, you would model those customers like how we do traditional personas in in an agile context and then have a secondary level of personas or would you like maybe model the customers as personas and say you know either or that's quite sophisticated most organizations are not there so if I'm working with an organization that is that sophisticated, then that's where we'll go with. And that's why I do that before I get into the workshop. Because if it's quite sophisticated, they've got personas or they've got archetypes, then we can work on that. Um, just on that though, I if you go back to that comment from Adrian Cockcroft from Amazon or AWS, where he turned around and said, if you want to understand what Amazon did, it's because we saw an unmet need. I believe the time of personas and archetypes might be passing. Because I think if you can identify a need, that need cuts across demographics. That need cuts across archetypes. And once you say we've identified a need and that need will be something that lots of different people have, that need can almost become a segment. And I'm working with a, with a banking client at the moment that is trying to go down that path of doing something different in terms of digital banking is we focus on needs as segmentation. Um, it's like a micro segmentation because you can manage multiple needs and know that with that one need, you're, you're, you're attracting different types of personas. But that's a little bit, that's experimental. That's very much in the uncharted space on, on my map at the moment in terms of what we're doing. But I think that's something that could be happening in the near future. Because again, I think that's what the Chinese companies are generally doing. They're identifying needs. They're not basing it around personas. Well, it helps to reduce the elvish in those contexts that you mentioned. Thank I you. think, so um, that. Uh, can I add something to that? Um, one of the challenges I find with personas is it, it's while it's very useful to meet the current needs, as as soon as you start thinking about personas, you're thinking about your existing customers. A lot of the time, innovation comes from customers you haven't thought about. Um, an example of it again from hire is um, someone from hire realized in Thailand, you know, the farmers, they don't have enough money to, so it's, it gets very hot during the summertime. They don't have enough money to buy air conditioning. And they, they, because their revenue, they, 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 they revenue is not, you know, constant, it's hard for them to also get credit. So um, what they did was they partnered with the telco as well as a finance institution. They zero designed, so, so they zero engineered a, a, a new um, unit, which is um, 
significantly uh, less cost. And then they are they were charging the farmers based on their usage. So they didn't start with an existing customer or an existing need. They actually find a completely different uh, customer, very different need. That's obviously an example of an existing product for a different segment, but there are also he, no, number of other examples where they actually find a need somewhere that they do not have any product for it neither. So I think personas are really good at optimizing the customer's need and maybe discovering some new needs. But as Marcus said, I think uh, actually, again, that was another insight. Thank you so much, Marcus, for that comment. I haven't, again, connected the dot that kind of moving on from those words with the pace of change and the rapid innovation. We can't just keep talking about our existing customers all the time. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's needs. I think there are un, underserved needs, and then I think there's unmet needs. And I think there's a huge, there's, this is one of the areas where I feel perhaps within the wardy mapping, I, I haven't, I think that's where people sometimes struggle when they start wardy mapping, because whenever you look at a map, if the need is not obvious and clear to you at the top of the map, it's, it's impossible to read the rest of the map. 90% of maps I can't read them because I don't understand the context, but I also don't understand what need you're trying to meet. So that's where I take a little bit of time beforehand with clients just to really identify. It doesn't have to be we do a lot of research to identify needs. We start with their best assumptions. Sometimes we have sophisticated organizations where we can go a little bit deeper, um, but it's. I think that's the part of wardy mapping that I'm trying to develop a little bit more because I think it's a little bit underdeveloped in the theory at the moment because a lot of, I think, think maybe because it comes from the IT world, sometimes the needs are given. We need a button that does X. And so then they map out what, what, what that does, what's needed to, to make that. But when you're dealing in customers who don't even know what they need, and sometimes it's, it's just a feeling that's a, that's, that area is a lot more complex. And I think that's where there's going to be a lot more development and a lot greater use of wardy mapping once that part of it is done. But somebody mentioned there about jobs to be done. I think it's, it's that entire world, it's jobs to be done. It's unmet needs, undermet needs. Um, it's it's about seeing, you know, Stanislavski method, seeing the world through your eyes of your customers. All of that is the big area of, of development, I think, going forward. Because again, that's what Hire has shown with the example that you gave, Ali, that about understanding why people are, are you know, using a washing machine. But again, there's nothing new in this. Theodore Levitt, wasn't it? It was who, you know, 60 years ago, trying to say nobody wants a quarter inch drill. They want they want a hole, but they don't actually want a hole. They want to put a, they want to put a picture up. They don't want to put a picture up. They want to create a home. Then once you start getting into that, you start to see all the things that you could be doing because now you're seeing it from the perspective of your user and that's radical for me that's revolutionary for 95 percent of organizations perhaps you jump on another theme Ellie, that you had it also uh between the duplication of a lot of solutions and the fact that perhaps a single solution is not the way to go you want to Ellie, that expand on that no, no, I I resonate with the with the slide, and I see examples of that. But I think the other extreme of it is finding one solution and rule them all, which is usually an ERP that never works, right? So I think um, even in nature, you have redundancies, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And quite often, innovation happens because you have redundancy and duplication, and then you look at all of those and say, oh, okay. So um, through the interaction of those, but there is a, I mean, a thousand. CRM is obviously ridiculous, um, <laughs> but the answer is not, in my opinion, is not a single, so we can't optimize it to the nth degree, but the current situation is so bad that it's a, it's a completely different universe. So I just wanted to kind of make that distinction as well. You can go also to the R extreme. No, it's, it's a good distinction. And one of the later principles, I think it's in phase three, when I say phase two, is effectiveness over efficiency. So do the thing right before you do uh, do the right thing rather than doing the thing right. So yes, there should be some, there's gonna to need to be some redundancy within a system. That may be for regulatory reasons, that may be for backup reasons, that just may just be you know, for developing resilience. The idea though is that, that those need to be conscious decisions. You don't want to have duplication just because the team might decide to do something and they haven't told anybody. You want to be aware of that and know consciously, yes, we want to build this redundancy. I have a company that I've just done this duplication and bias with as part of this adaptive leadership program. And they're in multiple different countries. And one of the countries 
their regulations and rules are so weird that they can't actually use the same technologies that the others are using. But at least we know that and we understand the reason for it. So it's about making conscious decisions about duplication rather than accidental ones. Hey, Abby has one about the comprehension of this, which is kind of connected. I had a question is why, Marcus, I mentioned at the beginning, um, if you think this will be the next big thing like Agile, why do you think it hasn't been adopted? And that kind of feeds into Abby's kind of, because it looks complicated. Because Wardlin has developed this, what? There's like a decade almost? Uh, 2005, he started using it. Uh, I think it's around 2011, he open sourced it. Um, and why, I mean, it take, I mean, when you speak to Wardley, he believes that it takes between 30 to 50 years for an idea to gain traction. I think if you take the Agile manifesto publication as being the starting point of Agile, then you say it was much quicker. But I think Agile has practices that go way back. I mean, the Agile manifesto was not the starting point of it. It was like a yeah, it was it was a landmark point. So it takes time. I mean, in the world of, I also teach at a university, and as I know from bitter experience there, the ideas only get accepted one death at a time. It's the same as in science. So there is a lot of inertia, and inertia is also one of the uh, is in the climate patterns in in the Wardley mapping method. There are sixteen different types of inertia. The reason why people resist ideas, um, but I think it has, considering there's absolutely no marketing budget behind it. Um, considering that it's really just about Simon releasing it and people like myself who find it useful uh, and speak to other people who find it useful, I think it has a significant amount of traction. On my website, I have about, I think it's about eight or nine um, cases from international companies and people in international companies who were using it. Um, I think the CEO of Shopify uses it, Amazon uses it extensively, uh, used by Salesforce, uh, Airbnb, and some of these are on, are on on my site. Um, so I think it does have that traction. Um, but I think there's also something, again, one of the climate patterns has punctuated the equilibrium. It's slowly, 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 and then it kind of moves very quickly. But there are some difficulties with, 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 with mapping to start with. And I think one of those, as I said, identifying needs, because that can be quite difficult. And the other one is that people get stuck into the mapping thing. So sometimes you make a map and it's kind of like quite hard to make your first map, then you go, and now what? What do I do with it now? And that's where, for me, the really interesting stuff on mapping is what you do once you've got a map. So that just takes time in terms of communicating it. Um, I think when I live in a country where Agile came much later than everywhere else, and that was nothing, 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 then suddenly it was like, everybody's everybody needs to go Agile. Um, and I think mapping will go th for the same kind of path. If it's useful, it will follow the same kind of pattern. The hockey stick thing. <laughs> Hopefully. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> Hopefully. Then. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Abby, but you had also... find it useful. Yep. Tell me. Sorry, go on. No, no. I just wanted to put Abby in the discussion because he had a question on resistance and how to address it. Abby, you want to expand? Just a minute. Uh, um, Mihail, just hang on. Oh, I'm looking at the message. Okay, it's a good tool, however difficult to find hey. and stand by people. Hey, yeah. we can see you. No, uh, sorry, I was not dressed properly. That's why I don't know my idea. <laughs> uh, Marcus, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. And I'm not being a critic, but I just want to understand and handle um, difficult conversations with people when you talk about what we map, right? Now, now, given obviously, this requires a bit of an SME approach, right? Where you need to be quite well equipped to run workshops. And it's it's just more of a like introduction of another tool in in the repository of tools, right? How do you how do you address the resistance of uh, acceptance? Because people these days is an SMS generation, right? They want everything easy, think on their plate. They don't want to work hard for anything. Um, so how do you mm -hmm. Uh, how do you address this concept of resist resistance of acceptance? Focus on the user need. Give them something that's easy to do then. Don't try and sell them at all. Nobody wants to learn at all. I mean, once I got my head around Wardley Maps, kind of, I think this is fantastic. And I would tell people about it and they would look at me and go, 
that's I'm not interested in this. So again, you have to get away from what you need, which is I want to tell people about this to what people need. So uh, it took me a while to start adopting <clears throat> The principle for myself. But what I do now is I, I don't do any more presentation. I do things like this, but I don't do any presentations for potential clients because too often I would go and I'd spend an hour talking to them and I'd give them what I thought was a fantastic presentation. And they would get to the end and they would say, it seems very interesting, but I don't really understand it. And it's like the waste of my time, it's a waste of their time. So a few years ago, what I started doing is I start to give people a, a free map, a free demonstration. So just tell me what problem you have and tell me who will benefit most from solving that of course you but maybe it's your boss or maybe it's your client and then tell me what you think that they want or what they think that they need um so just tell me those three things and then i will spend an hour with ais is far easier so i will spend an hour just making a map that map's going to be wrong 100 it's going to be wrong because i know nothing about your context and ai only knows some odd things as well but with that map i can then turn around and sit with you for 45 minutes and ask you to correct the map. Tell me what's wrong with the map. Tell me what's missing. Tell me what, what's, what's confusing about it. And we, we will change it there and then within 45 minutes. What you'll find is what I found then is that people are not focused on the map because the map is about their context. They're focused on their context. They're focused on their situation and they're seeing it from a slightly different perspective. Ah, and if you've got a couple of people in the room, you start to then have that conversation where they go, I didn't realize that. Why is it that? And then you've got that sharing of knowledge. And then after a, about the first 15 or 20 minutes, when you need to get people you know, a little bit explaining what a map is, this is a value chain. And all we start on the right-hand side because there's more certainty so people get it. But then after about 15 or 20 minutes, they start to have the conversation amongst themselves. And it's from the conversation that the new insights about what they can do comes from. The map is, I mean, if I give you a map of, of, of let's say Beijing, the map's not going to tell you where to go. You, by using the map, will understand where you want, how you want to get around the place. And that's what happens when I have these meetings with, with clients. So after about that 15 or 20 minutes where they start to have that conversation, by the end of 40 or 45 minutes, they turn around and, and would say, often, this has been really helpful to help us understand our situation. I mean, I had one once. The first time I did this, and they actually got a, a, a quite a big um, contract from it. The client actually turned around and said, this has been useful. It's clear that the person who wrote this map doesn't have the first clue about our industry. And it's like, well, correct. I mean, the industry was chemical engineering. I know nothing about chemical engineering, but I was able to show them something that they could then correct and turn around and say, no, this is right, this is wrong. It's not about how good a map is. It's about the conversations that it allows. So don't try and tell people about mapping, show them. And so that's where, again, on my website, I have a free demo version where people can just send in a, a request. They'll have the map. And all I request is that they have 45 minutes to go through the map with me. And then they will turn around and say, is this useful? If it's not useful, I'll give you the map. And well, you don't need it because it's not useful. But if it's useful, then you can take that map and you can show other people inside your organization and start to have these conversations. And if it's not useful, it's taking you 45 minutes of your life to figure out that word the map is not for you. So I think that's the way I overcome the resistance. If people don't want to have a free service, they're not going to buy a service from me. Um, yeah. And if I can show them the map and they don't find it useful, then there's no point trying to pursue it any further. But those that find it useful then turn and say, this will be good to map other things. And that's where we then have the engagement. So that's the way I've learned to overcome resistance. Nice. Okay. Dave, apologies, I skipped your question, but it's quite interesting. And it will be a bit longer chat, I think. No, oh, thanks, no. thanks, Marcus. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, thanks, Mihail. Um, no, I think it's actually just more of an observation when I've done Wardley mapping quite often um, that um, the things I've found to the right-hand side, which are commoditized, uh, quite often the things which are then the most ripe for disruption because those commoditized things have been around for 10, 15, 20 years and things have moved. And whilst they're, they're sort of might be stuck in that mindset of thinking this is a fixed commoditized thing, there are people out there changing the world around that thing. And it's quite often a space right for being disrupted and moving back into that novel space. Have you, have you found something similar, Marcus, or is that a pattern I've, I'm on my own with? <laughs> no, I think I think that is probably, from a strategic perspective, that's probably the most compelling thing about what we mapping. Because mm. some people turn around and say, well, mapping, this, how is this different from product lifecycle? It's kind of like, you know, you've got your early adopters, you cross the chasm, then you, then you go through there. Well, there's multiple chasms because we're not looking at just the development of one iteration of a mobile phone, but phones over the course of their life, life 
time, which is like you know decades. Mm. But once you get into that space around commoditization, it's just before they become a commodity, it becomes interesting because you've got potential weak signals. You've got, again, users complaining about value for money. Why am I paying so much for servers? Or why am I paying so much for a mobile phone? Does my Apple iPhone do that much different from my Chinese phone, which is a third of the price? So you've got these user complaints. You've also then got the idea of, well, is there a concept that you can actually have a mobile phone which can be used as a commodity by potentially that you're downloading the operating system that you want? So the mobile phone itself is not is a commoditized tool. Well, mm -hmm. maybe that idea exists. Does the technology exist for us to, to do that? And if it does, then you should be the first one to move. That's where you should have a first mover advantage because there's a, a huge amount of certainty. People want mobile phones. People need mobile phones. If you can actually deliver something that meets that need of overcomes that need of is this value for money, then you know they're actually going to buy it. Then you become a platform on which the future then gets built. Like electricity becomes a platform on which computers get built. Com cloud computing becomes a platform on which the mobile revolution uh, gets launched. Mobile devices become a platform on which other things get built. So it, I would say it's probably the most important strategic part of a map because whenever you map something out, most things are on the right hand side and people don't know what to do with them. You say, it's just like, well, it's just a commodity. But if you can provide that to others to, to satisfy that need that they have, then yes, you have a huge advantage. But the one thing I would say in contrast to that, David, is that if you're already looking at that, whenever I map with people, they instantly go, I want to commoditize it because it's a platform and everyone's going to use it and we're going to be a bin, un monopoly mm. provider. And yet they're talking about a component on the left-hand side. And that left-hand side has this huge product space to go through of years and years of really healthy profits. So the idea is not to try to push things before it's, it's their time. But yes, when you see things on the right-hand uh, right -hand side, that's hugely valuable from a strategic perspective. I think that's where all the good strategic moves really come from. Um, and that's Wardley's first example when he was at Ubuntu. That's exactly what they did. AWS, that's what they did with, with cloud computing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... Um, that's what I think, again, going back to Hire, I think that's what Hire is doing with a number of their platforms. So no, it's not just you, David. I think it is probably mm -hmm. the most valuable part of, of, of mapping. Um, mm -hmm. But don't get pulled into the industrializing or, or making utility service out of commodity if it's still in the product space, because there's, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of profit to be made there. Cool. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, past the hour, guys. Marcus, maybe one or two more questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm free. Uh, Con, you had a question. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of my work has been around convincing different cohorts around systems thinking. And so the main question uh, usually around any kind of org change is who is the best people to get in the room for cut through? So who do you find, Marcus, in terms of um, who, where, where does the most success get uh, driven out of? And then I didn't write this in the, the, uh, the chat, but just also do you find regressions based on those cohorts? Like do you find people snap back under certain conditions have you seen that that also okay i can tell i can tell you you don't want in the room you don't want people who do strategy in the room <laughs> because this is this tends to be quite threatening to them um so it's always best to go through uh a leader who is genuinely so the strategy framework that I use in conjunction with with war mapping is the is playing to win by Roger Martin because it's also based on the same five factors from the art of war. It's you know, he calls it win aspiration, where to play and how to win. Um, so you really need to find organizations and leaders who are playing to win rather than just playing not to lose. So those who are just playing not to lose are going to be doing best practice. They're going to be trying to get McKinsey in, or they're going to be trying to get, you need those who turn around and say, look, the old ways are not working. I need to try something different. So it's more, not so much about a functional role. It's about an, an attitude. And that attitude needs to be, firstly, I want to win. And if you can get that from the top, that makes it a lot easier. That's why I do the, the free map. So they can turn around and say, this has been valuable. Then they can use their power or their trust tagging to turn around and say, look, you guys, I want you to learn maps because this is going to be helpful. So whenever I do a mapping session, though, it's important to have somebody who understands the user. And often that's going to be marketing or sales or customer service. There needs to be somebody who understands the operations 
in production. Sometimes that's finance is pretty good for that because they know what you're spending money on. And then you need somebody who understands the underlying technologies, so IT people. So we, so I never have more than three or four people in a group where they're mapping something, but it needs to have those three different levels. Um, without that, then you end up having the people who, who know what users need and then have a big blank space where the technology comes in. And if you have just technology people, they have no idea what users need. It's just, it's just, it's just a tech stack. And they go, well, why do we need to map? We've already got our, our own tech stack. So I think it's, it's difficult to turn around. I mean, I've sometimes found finance people to be brilliant. And then on a project I had earlier this year, the finance person was just a pain in the backside because um, they only saw things from a finance perspective. So I think it's more, and this is also one of the principles in phase three, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on the 40 that we're talking about, which is about think aptitude and attitude. So you'll have engineers, but you'll have different types of engineers. So you're really looking for those, I think, who are more not innovative, as that's a good thing, because you have creative people who are adaptive, you have creative people who are innovative as well. One's not better than the other, but you want those people who are a bit more comfortable dealing with uncertainty, because this is going to be uncertain, this is going to be new. Uh, and that often comes from people with a bit of pain that they need to try something different or a bit of ambition that they want to try and win. So I think it's more that attitude rather than saying it's HR, it's definitely not HR, um, or, it's, or it's IT. I think it has to come from somebody with a little bit of authority, but that somebody who is willing to try something new and you figure that out by doing, I mean, when I say I give those free demos, about half the demos that I give turn into clients and the other half don't. And so I think, well, that's those people who um, it didn't resonate with. And I can't really judge why it doesn't resonate based on functions. I, we, use a, we use an approach called the Curtain Adaptive Innovator Inventory, which uh, it gives us an idea about how people uh, like to approach uncertainty. And I think those people who are a bit more comfortable with uncertainty, this is useful because it's turned around and says, okay, we can visualize it. Um, within the mapping community, we've had this discussion about whether, you know, is it about people who like visualizing things and the right people to approach? Um, but my wife is a psychologist and she piped in and it seemed to go, it seemed to resonate with others, is that it's those people who are fearful of you exposing that they don't know anything. Hmm. Um, and so whatever put in the, whatever level of the organization where they are they have imposter syndrome or they really don't know what they're doing and they're just kind of bluffing it, which is quite common, they're not going to like this because you need to know the details, you're going to expose things. So it needs to be people that you're comfortable with. And that's why I say for me, it's medium sized companies that are better or small teams in large organizations because they are comfortable exposing things that they don't know. So I think it's more of a personality thing rather than a functional thing. And that's again, mm -hmm. trial and error at the moment, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's fair. Thanks. Perhaps just one more question. Abby had the uh, hand up for quite some time. Are you there, Abby? Yeah, just um, last one, um, Marcus, and very practical question. There are some competitors, you know, to a Wadley map, SWOT analysis, pistol analysis, and other ones, right? So um, what advantage does this tool has over the rest of them? Because it looks to me, it's this is another tool which is solving a specific problem which the competitors can also solve. So why would anybody adopt this as such? Yeah, well, I've actually written the, the book. I'm writing uh, chapter 20. Um, it's actually comparing maps to SWOT analysis and business model canvas. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in short, a SWOT analysis um, doesn't take any focus on user needs. There's nothing about users in, in, in a SWOT analysis. Um, so I think a SWOT analysis, and again, you go to Roger Martins where uh, he would turn around and say a SWOT analysis is a terrible way to start a strategy process. So you can have at the end of a process, you can then uh, have a SWOT analysis, which you populate with what you've done with mapping. And if you map out your competitors, then you, because often SWOT analysis, people say, what are my strengths? Well, that might be your strength, but if it's a competitor's even better, then it's not a strength, is it? Well, there's um, more of so like an opportunity. Yeah, it's an as a situation, but you can always have a target situation, right? You can do a tools analysis. Yeah. So all I want to understand, I said, yeah, there's some these tools can also solve these problems. I just want to understand so that I can articulate best to the stakeholders that I deal with. Why is what the, the map a niche thing as compared to the rest of the thing? Okay, so I would turn around and say there's a hierarchy in strategic thinking. 
Um, and so most people, when they think strategy, you know that strategy is about answering why. And that's what you're trying to figure out with the SWOT analysis. Why should you do this rather than that? Because it's strengths, because yeah. there's opportunities and blah, blah, blah. Um, so you need to understand why before you understand how you do things. And how you do things is like the business model canvas. What's the, what's the business model and the operational model we need to be able to execute it? So it's why before uh, how, and it's how before who, what, and when, who does these things. But before you do all of this, you need to understand where you can focus. You need to understand where your options are. And I think that's what the mapping does. So it's where before why, where are your options first? And you give yourself multiple options, then you can compare them and say why this option is better than that option. But often if you're not doing that, if you're not looking at your landscape, your why is, well, why are we doing that? Because that's what Tesla does, or that's what McKinsey did, or I read that in Harvard Business Review. So mapping generates multiple wares for you to focus on. And when you've got multiple wares, then you can start to compare them and say, why is this one better than that one? And once you've got that, then you can turn around and say, well, how do we execute with it? And mapping can take you through that process. So that's the way I would say I use it mostly when I'm doing strategy, the strategy in the day is about identifying where you can play on the market. And I don't think a SWOT analysis gives you that because it lacks context. It's just a, it's just a checklist of ideas. And often that's gonna be created through power relationships that will every idea go in or is there somebody who's choosing what ideas do and what ideas don't go in? And it lacks context as well. Um, so I think yeah. the mapping for me, I would say it's, it's about identifying the where first. You can use then SWOT analysis to communicate things. You can use a business model canvas, which I think is fantastic in certain respects, for making sure that you've, you've got everything covered in your map. But the mapping is just the first stage to turn around and say, where should we be focusing? Um, so I think it's this tool that you would use before the others. So it's more like you're always prioritizing your uh, needs and wants. Well, it's giving, it's giving you awareness. It's giving you awareness of where the options are in your landscape, rather than just choosing one because that happened to come out in, in, in a brainstorming session. Um, yeah. It's very difficult to judge ideas in a brainstorming session about how good they are. But once you map things out and you turn around and say, well, why is that better than that? Well, this one's bottom left. Well, I work with a lot of technology people and normally, and these are innovative people, and when we map it out, everything's always in the bottom left. There are things which they are custom building, which customers don't see, don't care about. So stop doing that. That's not valuable. But when you, if you, if you bring a, a group of tech people together, they would turn and say, well, our strength is we're innovative, but you're innovative in a way that nobody cares about. And you can see that straight away in the map because you can turn around and say, well, that's close to customers. Therefore, they're going to care about it. That's far away. Even if you're brilliant, they're not going to do anything. So it gives you that context that you can start to have those questions and challenge those assumptions. Because otherwise it's becoming, why my idea is better than your idea? Well, it's because I've been here longer. I've got a bit more of a reputation. But some of these ideas, the one I gave you in, in the presentation about this, this Fortune 500 company, I kind of lied a little bit because I remember who the idea came from. It came from the most junior person in the room. That was the challenge that came from them. That person's voice would be hidden within within a, within a brainstorm, a normal brainstorming session. When you put it in context, you don't know whose idea it is. You can then start to see because of the context, which and where, how close they are to user needs, um, which things are going to be more valuable than the other things, and that then helps you prioritize. And I think that's very okay. difficult to do the SWOT analysis. Okay, thank you. And just to wrap up, we have twenty minutes past. Marcus, many thanks for. A coming over to talk to us, but also You're staying welcome. 20 minutes more. And uh, thanks to uh, all of you guys for joining and the guys who basically left. But uh, we will post this on uh, YouTube. Hopefully, I'll be able to do it tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. And also put the chat, which has the links as well. Uh, and we are looking at where best to put the presentation. The presentation will also be so. Once you get on YouTube, once you see the video, you have the links to everything else. Now, just a note, um, Marcus, you mentioned all Samus work is open source. Uh, yep. The book will be open source or so far, whatever is on Medium? Mine, yes, yeah, it's, it's all on Medium. So it's it's all out there already. I'd say the first okay. 20 chapters are done. Um, the, the, the next 10 chapters will be ready and be published by the end of this year, uh, I'd have thought. But the yeah. first chapter is, is, is a lot of it. Some people put things like requisite variety. So there's a chapter on that. There's a chapter on some examples. So it's really about my journey in terms of understanding and the wider context. And that's based around the Eastern and Western approaches to strategy. Because my definition of, of, of the Eastern approach to strategy is, is about awareness and adaptiveness rather than strategic planning. So it's, it's about that. And then the first chapter really goes into talking about the mapping method itself. And I use that to map out uh, the shipping industry, um, strangely enough, uh, even though I know very little about that. So again, many thanks from all of us.
And until we uh, talk next time. Thank you. See you at the next meetup. All. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. The... Thank you, Mihai. Have. have a good night. Bye. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, everyone. Before you go, Marcus, I'll oh. put a link in the chat. Is that uh, the the spot? Uh, Medium.com, Marcus, not guest. Is that the right one? or? Sounds correct. Uh, yeah, that'll be it. That'll be it. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff on there, um, but the actual book itself is the section that's Outthink and Outmove. But I've got quite a lot of blogs on there, but Outthink and Outmove is, is the structured stuff that I'm doing uh, at the moment. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, that's the one. Thanks very much. Awesome. Okay. Cheers. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you, everyone.